And every time I start this speech, I, because I'm, I'm becoming older and older, so I start with this study. <laughs> Believe me or not, this was the first study that I published in my whole career. It was 1994. And I was looking at, let's say, risk factors for renal dysfunction with my very little database. At that time, I had something like four, four, four to 500 patients inside the database, and I, now I have 25,000. And that was chasing for predictors of acute kidney injury. And we sorted out with this strange relationship. It was the first time someone could actually associate the nadir hematocriton CPB with the risk of severe renal dysfunction. And at that time, if we, you were running a pump in my institution with an hematocrit of 20%, your risk of uh, severe renal dysfunction means uh, acute kidney injury stage two or three uh, was 12%. After the study we had, after 10 years, Nobody happened for something like 10 years, uh, but after 10 years, Americans and other people in the world start noticing again this, that there was this association between the lowest hematocrit during CPB and different degrees of acute kidney injury. We have now a pile of studies demonstrating this. So uh, we went back to the, to the concept that we had uh, not lost, I mean, after the, the previous study, we start reducing our hematocrit, our, sorry, priming as much as possible and trying to run our pumps with the highest possible hematocrit, I mean, highest uh, in the range of, let's say, 28, 30%, not higher. Then we start thinking again about why someone who is running a pump, who is receiving a pump with a severe hemodilution should develop a good kidney injury. And since uh, I'm an anesthesiologist, so I'm used to think in terms of oxygen delivery and what we call the goal-directed therapy. That means <clears throat> we want the patient not on, on pump. Every kind of critically ill patient, we would like the patient with a normal SVO2, and we would like a patient with an acceptable DO2. So we start thinking maybe it's again a matter of uh, oxygen delivery. I mean, oxygen content is part of the oxygen delivery. So we did this second study, uh, again, a retrospective trial, looking at all the predictors of renal dysfunction, and we could find that, yes, the hematocrit was a predictor, but the lowest DO2 was even better. I mean, in statistical terms, uh, we had the best relationship for the lowest oxygen delivery. And uh, we could even see that this was true even in a multivariable model. And for the first time, we found a number with adequate statistical tools. We found that the best cutoff was 272 for a patient who was running, uh, receiving a pump at a, a temperature of, let's say, moderate hypothermia, not below 32 degrees. And those who were treated at a level of DO2 higher than this cutoff level were actually experiencing uh, acute kidney injury at a, at a significantly lower rate than those who were treated below this level, regardless of the hematocrit. So the, the, the concept is, you have a low hematocrit, then you increase your pump flow, and you get a normal DO2, and you will get rid of or you will decrease your risk of acute kidney injury. After that, again, another six years, we tried to see if this was true, and this number was true even in other settings. So we did another study with two external groups, one in London and the other one in Ghent, Belgium, and we it was again a retrospective study, <coughs> practically similar to what we did before. And again, we, we introduced another number that Mark quoted to you that was the uh, VCO2, production of CO2, and the ratio between the DO2 and the VCO2. And I will show you later on why this is probably very much important. And again, we found association. We found interesting association, and we could see that the number was more or less the same, a DO2 around 260. So 
different hospitals, different settings, same number. And the DO2 v CO2 around five was again a good cutoff level for defining the optimal perfusion, let's say, or a perfusion that is reducing the risk of acute kidney injury. Again, those treated above this number had an acute kidney injury stage two that was actually something like one third than the other one. So, seems to make sense. And, uh, and nowadays, this is very well accepted. I mean, many guidelines are including the concept of the DO2, DO2 within the optimal perfusion strategy. This is something like a couple of years ago. This group could, again, see that those who had an acute kidney injury were treated at the lowest DO2 than those who did not. And uh, interesting enough, the SVO2 was absolutely the same. It was not sensitive to detect the risk of acute kidney injury. Uh, if I look at the history of acute kidney injury in my institution, as I was telling you now, I have a very huge database. And I have all these numbers. We have the DO2, we have the hematocrit. And so we look at this, looking at different kind of interventions that we have been applying during those, these years to reduce the burden of acute kidney injury. Uh, so we found the usual suspect as predictors of acute kidney injury, uh, but the nadir hematocrit value was confirmed as independent determinant with an increase of the risk of 7% relative risk, of course, per each point of nadir hematocrit value. From the point of view of the let's say, population, you see here we have something like, uh, let's say, it's, uh, 15 or 16,000 patients divided by a couple of years. So you see, as everybody knows, age is increasing and uh, the diabetic rate is increasing, redo operation, I think, so it's what population is becoming more and more severe. And uh, the acute kidney injury rate actually had an increase up to the, let's say, 2005, and then start decreasing at this level. And simultaneously, as I was mentioning you, we could increase our nadir hematocrit value. So if I look at all the intervention that we actually did, uh, what I can say is that we could reduce the acute kidney injury rate by using a number of tools. I mean, first of all, reducing the priming volume. Uh, and this was quite effective, whereas centrifugal pumps that we are routinely using now, if I look at before and after, no difference. I mean, centrifugal pumps are good from my perspective for many reasons, but they do not reduce the acute kidney injury rate. But if you look, uh, well, uh, avoiding angiography on the day of surgery is effective. We could reduce by 1% the rate of acute kidney injury. And uh, you know, this is in the guidelines now for patients at high risk for acute kidney injury. But the most important thing was this concept of the goal-directed perfusion that we started here, 2005, when we discovered this association. Goal-directed perfusion means we try to perfuse a patient at the DO2 higher than 270, 280. This is the range. And this is the difference. It's something like 50% uh, less acute kidney injury. And we could even get some, some more benefit with ultra-low prime oxygenator. So as a, a result of this strategy, look at this. This is the risk of acute kidney injury in the 2000-2007 based on the nadir hematocrit. And this is from 2008 to 2013 in the goal-directed perfusion era. So you see, hematocrit is still a determinant of acute kidney injury risk, but for the same level of hematocrit now, we could <coughs> reduce the risk by about 50%. So it seems that it works. And not by chance, it is now included in a number of review articles, expert opinions. These guys are telling us intraoperative strategies include minimizing hemodilution, maximizing oxygen delivery, and I totally agree on this. So what is the 
why the kidney is so sensitive to a low oxygen delivery? I would say every organ is sensitive to this. Every organ is working with oxygen. Nobody is happy when the oxygen delivery is going down. Uh, I would say the first suffering organ is probably the intestine, the gut mucosa, but we don't have markers for this. Uh, but we have for kidney. And kidney, actually, I will show you some data that a, a very experienced group in Gothenburg, the group of uh, Sven Erik Riksten, they did publish this uh, uh, some, some months ago in anesthesiology, but this, they, they show this data at the European Congress of Anesthesia a couple of years ago. So they could do something very special. They placed a swan gans catheter inside the renal vein, so they could actually separate kidney from the other organs and they could look at oxygen delivery, oxygen extraction at the level of the kidney. And what they found out was that, of course, going on CPB, they could increase the cardiac index, pressure, no change, hemoglobin, of course, decreased on CPB. In a, even if you look at this, this group was a group of believers in low hemodilution, so this is a, a nice level of hemoglobin on CPB. The renal blood flow, no huge differences, but if you look at the oxygen delivery, so you see this is systemic, no changes, but at the renal level, there is a decrease once you start going on CPB that is maintained even post-CPB. And the oxygen extraction rate of the kidney is progressively increased. And of course, markers of acute kidney injury are going up. And basically what they could find was that before CPB there was this level of DO2. Uh, this, is, this is not index, this is absolute value. And uh, about 14% was going to the kidney that was extracting 10% of the oxygen. Once on CPB, this was increased, but actually this one was decreased down to 10%, so the kidney was extracting more oxygen. And the worst condition is after CPV, where you have an oxygen extraction rate of close to 20% from the kidney. So kidney is in need for oxygen. So to conclude, what we know, to be sincere, is simply that we have an association between low levels of DO2 and the rate of acute kidney injury. This is coming from retrospective trials, registers, experience, opinion, and uh, it, but it's just an association. We cannot clearly say, okay, if we do something to avoid, if we follow the goal-directed perfusion strategy, that is an active strategy, I mean, perfusionist is asked to do something whenever the DO2 is going down, and now we have the monitors that online are providing us with this value. We cannot clearly say with a level of evidence one uh, that this will reduce the, the, the acute kidney injury. So to do this, we need a randomized control trial. So uh, three years ago, two, three years ago, we started with this goal-directed perfusion trial that is actually multi-center prospective randomized control study on the concept of goal-directed perfusion. Um, there were 10 institutions in Europe, USA, New Zealand, and Australia that were started collecting this, uh, this uh, data on this patient population. GIFT is a very pragmatic study. The entry criteria is simply you need a cardiac surgery with CPB, you need an adult patient with an expected CPB duration of at least 90 minutes, because of course I think that very short pump run probably are not sensitive enough to show clinically relevant consequences. And uh, a very few exclusion criteria, severe anemia or, or a chronic renal failure and so on. And the primary aim point of this study is the acute kidney injury every kind, stage one, stage two, or stage three. And we have secondary outcomes like le length of ICU stay and other, and other things. I don't, I'll go very fast on these uh, um, slides that are basically how many patients do we need. Well, if we rely from, mm, on, on the previous study, 
it's not that much because actually the difference is very high. I mean, it's something like 30% <laughs> or 12% uh, of any kind of any kidney injury. The problem is that, yes, we hypothesized this for a 40% reduction. So we, we have been quite conservative. Uh, and the, the main problem is that uh, we don't know how many, we didn't know how many patients in both arms actually were below or above the value because, of course, control arm was not intentionally treated below the value. There were patients who spontaneously were reaching the, DO, the target DO2. So the, the, the power of the study was very difficult to, to be settled and uh, the unique difference of treatment was a perfusion target on DO2 higher than 280, and transfusion triggered not just by hematocrit, but even by a, a low SVO2 or an increased oxygen extraction rate. This is the CRF form that we have been using, and I can tell you this is the composition of our group. And now we are at 350 patients. And uh, I cannot show you the data uh, because, of course, we, the, the paper is still, manuscript is still under, under construction. Uh, but I can show you something. Uh, the metabolic parameters that we could collect without showing you any difference between groups, it's just to pool data to stress the possible interrelationship of these metabolic parameters and even something about the outcome. This is. Uh, DO2, and you see, this is ICU stay. Well, there is a, a significant, albeit not incredibly high, relationship between the nadir DO2 and the ICU stay. But basically, uh, nobody with a DO2 higher than 280 experienced a very prolonged ICU stay, so a very high negative predictive value. And then other combination of factors that may offer some insight. DO2 and SVO2, and you see here that uh, providing that the DO2 is higher than 280, you have a normal SVO2, SVO2 starts declining here. So it's clear demonstration that patient is extracting more and more oxygen. And uh, the SVO2 and the peak VCO2, this is a nice relationship but, well, it's telling us uh, not that much because VCO2 can be, there is a good CO2 production that is the aerobic one, and there is a bad CO2 production that is the anaerobic one, as Mark Bennett showed you. Um, so this one is uh, probably a little bit more interesting. We have a relationship with the peaks VCO2 and SVO2. This is basically aerobic. CO2 production, and here you have an increased oxygen extraction in the patients with uh, an increased VCO2. SVO2 alone is again is not telling us that much. I mean, SVO2 has practically no relationship with peak lactate formation, a marker of anaerobic state. Uh, if you look at the VCO2 more or less the same, because again, VCO2 can be a good one or a bad one. You don't know. You should look at this, that is the most important parameter. If you look at the DO2 VCO2 ratio, then you can understand whether your VCO2 production is aerobic or anaerobic, and not by chance. Uh, what you can see here is that, he, yes, when you go below this level, you have here a number of patients with hyperlactatemia, and you have no hyperlactatemia if the DO2 VCO2 is higher than 6, so a little bit higher than the level of 4 or 5, 5.5 that we have found in, the, in our previous studies. <coughs> so the results of the gift will be available very soon. I think we will uh, send the manuscript by the end of March, uh, and, and I will and later on, we will show this in our in, in meetings and uh, uh, opportunities like this one. Thank you very much.